Welcome to Skip the Queue, a podcast for people working in or working with visitor attractions. I'm your host, Kelly Molson. Each episode, I speak with industry experts from the attractions world. In today's episode, I speak with Steve Mills, founder of Decision House. What does the cost of living crisis mean for attractions as we move into winter and beyond? Steve gives us a snapshot of how your potential visitors are feeling and what the next few months might hold for the sector. If you like what you hear, subscribe on all the usual channels by searching Skip the Queue. We had a small issue with Steve's audio, but don't let that detract from the important content. This is a really, really important episode. Steve, thank you so much for joining me on Skip the Queue podcast today. It's really good to see you. Pleasure. Thanks for inviting me, Kelly. I've got a few icebreaker questions for you, Steve. You can only save one of the Muppets. Which Muppet do you choose and why? I'd, well, I'll tell you the one I'd like to be. I'd like to be the drummer, Animal. Aspiring to be fun and exciting and a bit off the wall, really, to be honest. But I, th- I would say very much it's an aspiration rather than reality. <laughs> um, I'm probably more like the uh, tutor, who's the more rational, down-to-earth, logical one. So I think that, I think that might come across in what we talk about today, Steve. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> fair enough. No, that's, that's, that's definitely it for me. All right. How would you describe your job to a two-year-old? I find out all the fun stuff that people like doing. That's a great answer. (laughs) That is a great answer. You nailed that, Steve. Good. Okay. Last show that you binged watched on your television viewing platform of choice. I feel like the BBC, I don't know why I've done that. I'm not the BBC. They don't, no one cares what I say. No, no, Netflix, it's all right. Um, Amazon, whatever. Disney ooh, Plus. Well, I'm, I'm quite sporty. So Disney Plus, I've, I've been watching this series called Welcome to Wrexham, which is all about Wrexham and the football club and the fact that Ryan Reynolds and oh, the other guy whose name everybody always forgets, Jim, Joe, McElhenney or whatever it is, taken over on the football club and it's a kind of a, a fly on the wall. A uh, documentary about uh, how they've taken over the club and trying to make a success of it. But very interestingly, there's lots of these fly on the wall type documentaries, and this one is made for an American audience. But it has some quite subtle differences in there. So they have things like translations between um, English and American phrases for things like, you know, bloke means buddy, and that kind of thing as well. So it's, it's got a little twist in it, which I quite enjoy. That's interesting. So that's on my list to watch that one. Um, but we've watched like some of the, like we watched the Tottenham one that was on Amazon because we're big Tottenham fans. And we watched, what was the one that, was it Sunderland? Was there yeah. one about, yeah, we watched that one as well that was really good. Yes. So, the, oh, that would be, okay. So we watched that one and there's like little subtle differences because it's for Americans. All right, Steve, what is your unpopular opinion? Um, I thought that's an interesting first question because given my profession, which we'll come on to, it's kind of my job is really about conveying others' opinions rather than having them of my own, to be honest with you. But my unpopular opinion, and it's sticking with the sporting thing, really, is that I think that there's no better sporting drama than a five-day cricket match, oh, <laughs> which is definitely an unpopular opinion, to be honest, or even like a four-day cricket county championship match that's watched by three men and a dog on a kind of wet Tuesday in April to be honest because I, I know it's difficult to believe that anyone could be interested in a sport that where you can have a, a draw after five days worth of activity but um, for me it's it's kind of like reading a novel but it's being played out in front of your in front of your eyes in many ways so there's time to get to know all the characters properly and the story kind of ebbs and flows and you get these unexpected incidents happening that change the plot and you have you can see these individual battles gradually unfolding during five days that you'd never get in a kind of couple of hours. And what I like about it is it's a kind of test of character and a test of patience for the players, not just the audience, as well as kind of just pure sporting ability. So, yeah, it's, I'm sure it's a very unpopular opinion, but I think it's a kind of antidote to where we're going as a society generally so it's the whole antidote to having low attention span these kind of quick rewards and these superficial pleasures if you don't want any of that go and watch a five-day test match <laughs> kind of, ironically I've, i don't think i've ever done to be honest with you but it's certainly something i've got in mind when i retire in a few years time 
Steve, it was a really beautiful analogy. I really enjoyed your analogy about it being like a novel and the play, and you know, playing out the roles and the characters and stuff. But you have not sold it to me at all. <laughs> but, but, but well done on the analogy. Yeah. <laughs> all right, listeners, let us know what you think about Steve's cricket is a novel analogy, and we should all be watching cricket for five days. I know that I've got a lot of different things that I could be spending five days on, but there you go. <laughs> thank you for sharing <laughs> right Steve um I've asked you to come on today because we're going to do a bit of a state of the nation um chat but tell us a little bit about you and what Decision House does for our listeners that haven't heard of you which I'll be surprised if they haven't okay oh thank you yeah so I, I started off uh I started Decision House back in 2017 so I used to head up the tourism and culture team at BDRC, which is now called BDA BDRC. Um, so I headed them, those up for a, a good few years before that. So Decision House really kind of specialises in generating insights that help organisations in the culture and tourism sector specifically, and particularly attractions really, just helping them to make better decisions for their organisation. So kind of, it's kind of hence the Bronzefield type name decision house really. and we mainly do that by conducting sort of fresh primary research either with your current customers so whether you call your current customers visitors or bookers or members um, and that helps with kind of making sure that we deliver optimal or that they can deliver optimum experiences for their visitors or we do research with prospective com- uh, customers so more kind of market and audience research to understand how that they can grow their customer base actually so we can do that we do both on a quantitative uh, research so kind of the typical survey so online surveys face-to-face surveys etc or we also do qualitative research as well so things like focus groups and depth interviews which really kind of get under the skin of issues that that organizations have so typically Quantitative surveys will measure visitor opinion, whereas qualitative kind of gets to the visitors of why, gets to the kind of root of why visitors have their those particular opinions. So that, that's really what we do. And during COVID, we did an awful lot of work with Alba to really kind of track public sentiment. Um, and that led us to setting up visitor benchmarking surveys to, to understand the action to the visitors have to COVID measures being put in place once attractions reopened back in. 2020, and that's really both of those surveys, sort of public sentiment work for Alba and the Vista benchmarking have continued for the last couple of years and still going now, really, albeit they've, they've evolved into pieces of work that, that aren't COVID related anymore. They're, they're kind of more general public sentiment work now. And, and they've been incredibly valuable, Steve, and I reference them continuously, and I do reference the BVA, BDRC's work as well, um, and they've been incredibly insightful. It, now, I, I mean, we we spoke a couple of weeks ago about coming on to talk about the, the state of the nation and where people are, because I think what had been happening is I, I've i been contacted by a few attractions kind of saying, you know, what what have you heard? You know, uh, numbers are down a little bit. Is there something going, you know, what, what have you heard? What's the sentiment like? And I always kind of fire them your way. But I thought, why not get why not get the man in himself to talk us through where we're at? We've got a really weird situation at the moment in the UK. I mean, we're recording this. It's it's the 5th of October. Um, so we're in that kind of the run up to busy, what is usually a busy half term. And then the run up to Christmas, which can be quite quiet for, for a number of attractions, depending on what, on what you're doing. But we've got the cost of living crisis. We've got the pound was at its lowest since the 70s, which blows my mind. We've had the death of our monarch. We have a new king and a new prime minister all happening at once. I mean, <laughs> that's yeah. that's quite it's quite a lot to be dealing with. But I guess what does all of this mean for attractions as we move into that winter period and beyond? And I thought this is what we could talk about today, Steve. So where are we at? It's a big <laughs> question, but where are we at? A massive question. I mean, I'll, I'll try my best to try and pick some of those issues apart really. So I, I think if, if we deal with the, the, the death of Her Majesty the Queen, first of all, and the case of that might be, uh, and this, this is, a, I guess, a personal opinion, first of all, really. I mean, I, I think domestically, it's not going to have a huge impact, if I'm perfectly honest. People uh, will move on 
relatively quickly from that. I, I suspect attractions won't see, unless you are a, something that is specifically related to the monarchy, you, you probably won't see a huge amount of difference. I mean, clearly somewhere like Windsor Castle has already seen queues of people outside the gates, for example. Mm. But I, I think outside of that, that niche, domestically, I, I doubt we'll see a huge difference. But then... Obviously, internationally, there's, it's it's raised it's raised the profile, um, and actually, I think showcased all the kind of positive associations that that people abroad associate with the UK and why they travel here. So it's it's emphasised our heritage. It's emphasised our amazing ability in terms of the pomp and ceremony, etc. And it's been a great showcase for for London sites, to be honest. So I think internationally it should have a significant impact going into next year allied of course with the low value of the pound that's like, not all good obviously but obviously your exchange rate terms it's a good thing for next for next year particularly west wise so um I, I guess that's where i'd see the, death of the monarch situation it, In it's terms interesting of, like what you yeah. said about the 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 pomp i mean it, as we watched the funeral here um uh, you know, a very a very emotional day actually, and I was kind of I was transfixed to the ceremony for the entire you know the entire day. It, it was quite mesmerising, but in my head I just kept thinking like people, you know, outside of the UK that watch this, it's it's strange, isn't it? It's quite strange and it's very grand and it's a real sense of what the UK is about that kind of that that level of ceremony and people coming together it was it was quite phenomenal and it did make me think this is a it, it ultimately it's a really you know a sad day but it's such a big thing for the UK to to be able to do I wonder you know if that does represent a surge in international tourism because of that and people wanted to come and be a small part in that kind of that kind of thing yeah I and mean, I, I I think Increasingly, whether it's people from the UK or people coming into the UK, people want to do things now that is different, and they want to do they want to be seen to be doing things where you, that you can only do in one particular location. And I think the UK, I don't think there is anywhere quite like it in terms of ability to do, deliver on things like the pomp mm. ceremony, and that's what really sets us apart from many other countries around the world and I think we shouldn't forget that and not, and not be afraid to promote it yeah absolutely and then that brings us to the new king there will be a coronation yeah well, at some similar, point so similar, a similar yeah. similar kind of reaction to that probably yeah, yeah. and something yeah, yeah. very positive to celebrate as well yeah and yeah, yeah just showcasing that side of things definitely. Mm. but then yeah the other side of it is I think you mentioned cost of living um, so just that small little, probably, small little yeah, issue that less, we're all struggling positive. with. So, I, I think with that one, um, so we've we've uh, as as a lot of listeners will know. So we've been we were have been commissioned by Alva throughout COVID, and then also a couple of waves this year, um, just to gauge public sentiment um, into how people are feeling about visitor attractions. So we did a wave back in June um, this year, which kind of first highlighted some financial concerns of the attraction visiting public. Um, and they also said at that point that COVID actually was still a notable barrier, particularly for the older generation yeah. and those who are more vulnerable. Um, we've just literally hot off the press, so in, at the end of September, so we did another wave between the 22nd and the 27th of September just to kind of update that and try to understand how people are feeling about visiting attractions in the autumn and the winter up until about sort of February next year. So mm -hmm. you know, how the attraction is going to cope. And one of the key questions we ask is just a completely open question. That people can respond in any way they like to this question. But we just ask, at the moment, how are you feeling about visiting attractions over the next few months? So as I said, they can say absolutely anything there. We've not prompted them with anything at this point. Um, and I think the, the, the issues that are coming up here, first of all, on the positive side, is that COVID is being mentioned by less and less people. I think the assumption is that it's completely kind of not an issue anymore, but I wouldn't say it's done that. But back in June, we still had 15% of people at that point saying something to do with COVID was putting me off going to visitor attractions, which was partially explaining why we hadn't seen that bounce back to, to 
pre-pandemic levels. That's now in the September wave come down to 9%. So it's, it's disappearing. Okay. That said, you know, you've still got one in 10 people who've still got some sort of concerns around COVID. And as I said, it's particularly older people, vulnerable people are still saying that. Um, but then, so that's quite positive. But then the, on the other side, the financial concerns have gone up considerably. So again, back in June, we had about 15% of people mentioning some sort of financial concern as a barrier to why they wouldn't be visiting attractions mm-hmm. or would you know, make them think twice. But that's now gone up to 24, 25%, something like that. So okay. quite a significant increase. And again, it's, as you would expect, it's especially among those with lower incomes, but also families are, are increasingly expressing financial concerns. And this time around, we asked a specific question as well about um, whether there was any positive benefit of all the government support around energy bills. And actually, we're finding that it's probably not because the, any sort of positive benefit of government support is being negated by just the, the still absolute rises in energy um, mm. and energy costs. So it's, it's a difficult situation at the moment. And we've now got around about half the country really feeling that they feel worse off than they did at the same point last year. So clearly that's going to have, have um, a, a, an impact. Yeah. I wonder if it, I mean, so, I, so I'll give, I can give you an example. So I went to an attraction on Monday. I took my daughter, met up with some friends um, and went to Paradise Wildlife Park for the day. And I definitely thought more about what I was going to spend when I got there than I usually would. Um, yeah. And I thought, well, I'm quite lucky. My daughter is a is a big eater. She's not fussy. She eats anything. But I went, do you know what? I'm going to just pack her a pack lunch. So she's got sandwiches, fruit, whatever. And I'll buy myself my lunch when I'm there. And that just saves just a tiny little bit of money. It, you know, and it's, it sounds silly. It's insignificant. But it was enough to make me in my head go, I feel a bit better about that. And I probably spent longer at the attraction as well. Because in my head, I was like, well, you know, paid i want to get my money's worth um we'll go here and we'll go in the tumble tops place and we'll do the soft play and i just i really extended the time that i was at the attraction as well for the money that i paid for it and it wasn't unreasonable at all we had a great day it's a brilliant brilliant day out but it did make me think about just small changes i wouldn't have thought about six months ago yeah yeah, absolutely. I, I think you kind of picked up on secondary spend there. I think that is one thing that's going to be a challenge. And, and also uh, memberships as well. So we were a bit earlier in the year seeing people saying things like, well, I'll squeeze as much as I possibly can out of my existing memberships, which is a good thing. Um, makes you more likely to renew. But I think now we've reached the stage where people are starting to do that a bit less because they're actually scared of any visit occasion because there is secondary spend associated with even a even a, even a visit occasion that is associated with a membership, right. because you've got to travel to get there, you've got to, and then you've got to potentially yeah, have something to eat there or buy something in the shop. And I think the situation is now with some people that they're even even when they have a membership of some organisation, they're actually more reluctant to use it now, more than trying to squeeze as much as possible out of it. So I think wow. it's going to be a tough time for memberships over there few months definitely so we've got again evidence from that piece of work that is saying people are uh, less likely to renew and less likely to acquire new memberships over the next few months and they because of their personal financial situation and it's all within that 50 percent of people who are feeling worse off obviously which kind of i guess on the positive side um what we're seeing is that on I guess if there were going to be a prediction is that at the, at the high end, at the high end limited supply type products, that there's, there's virtually going to be no change there. So if, if you've got lim- yeah, limited supply of something that's priced at a high level, I think there is still going to be plenty of demands for, for that sort of thing. And you kind of see it, um, see it all the time, really. I mean, I, I think things like the, the old kind of Christmas lights displays, for example, attractions. I have a feeling they're still going to be okay and do well. I mean, I, I, I try to go to there's one reasonably local to me at Waterston, and I, I don't know if it's completely sold out yet, but I know the slots that we want to try and book, we booked three or four weeks ago. 
for it. Um, so I think those sorts of events at the kind of higher price point end with limited supply should be okay. In my view. Yeah, and I would I would agree with that again from personal experience of trying to book the Audley End miniature railway Christmas experience, which all I mean the the peak we all of the weekends are gone. You know, I I did manage to get a Friday. Thankfully, more for me, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> I yeah. can't wait to go on it. Um, but yeah, that, that's that sold. You know, those those peak Saturdays and, and, and weekend slots sold out with, within, you know, hours, you know, and they're, they're all gone completely. So, yeah, I we definitely agree with you on that. So do you think that that then leads attractions to. They're just going to have to try harder in terms of the experience that they're putting on. So, you know, can should they be looking at offering more offer uh, trying to offer things that are a bit more unique at a higher price point yeah i think yes yes definitely definitely um i think as well it's, it's important to point out that this isn't going to be kind of across the board so again there's there's a lot of evidence for again i, I guess this is all very intuitive but it's going to be a much higher impact negative impact on paid attractions and free attractions so there, again there's very strong evidence that that people will be switching out from paid attractions to free attractions but then even within that within paid attractions it's perhaps starting to um emphasize the yeah this, this is going to be about a value message here and what what else can you do um to add value to whatever ticket mm-hmm. whatever the ticket price is really so yeah and, and again so you know, a, a third of people said they will visit paid attractions less than normal, and only 13% said more. Whereas on the free attraction side, you've got a third saying they will visit free attractions more than usual, and only 8% said less. So, and again, that's all driven by those who feel worse off. So, it, yeah, it's just, it's, I think it's all about completely about that value message over the, this winter, yeah. even if you are, yeah, if, if you are, a, and I think it's kind of, need that reassuring communications around it. And I think as well, um, what's also come out of this is there's this assumption that the the cost of visiting attractions will be rising at the same rate as everything else in the economy. Oh. So there are quite a few people saying things like just assuming that yeah, Vista attra- the cost of visiting attractions is going to be going up. So I think there is a really important communications message to, to put in there right. some attractions to come across is that you know we are maybe holding our prices at 22 levels or, or whatever it is or you know only increasing it by a small amount or add it, adding this this extra value item in or whatever it is so i think something that is related to value and price has to be the message this year just to reassure people that actually we're not going up at the same prices energy and wheat and sunflower oil and all the rest of it actually it's going to be fairly marginal if anything for, for visitor attractions yeah so i thought it was quite one of the quite interesting things that came out of it that's really interesting isn't it yeah i hadn't considered that and i think um i mean look it's unfair to say that attractions won't be putting up their prices because mm-hmm. their energy bills are going up just as ours are and actually their energy bills are going up more dramatically in ours because there's no currently no cap on businesses so um there isn't a reassurance piece to be done, but I think that has to be done quite tactically by the attraction because they can't come out and say, look, we're not putting our prices up. We're not doing this because they might have to because of the cost of living. So, okay. But that's, um, that's something that I wasn't expecting that they just assumed that it would rise that rapidly. Yeah. And coincidentally, I read something somewhere recently um, in the trade press as well. I've just, I've done some research across other sectors as well, and we're seeing a very similar similar sort of scenario as well. So, and actually, when you think about it, if you, if you average Joe Public, if, if inflation's at ten percent, your immediate thought is, well, everything's going up ten percent, right? Mm. So, wh- wh- why wouldn't it be? You, most members of the public wouldn't think about the nuances of what's going up and what isn't going up. So, um, I think it's just something to, to bear in mind. Although, again, what what I would say is that. I, I'm of the view that attractions should try and hold their nerve in terms of pricing, and I suspect there won't be much merit in reducing prices or holding prices as they are just for the sake of it, because I don't think we're talking here about those 
those people who are financially squeezed, the odd pound or two lower admission price to Vista attraction, I don't think it's going to make a huge amount of difference to whether they visit or not, to be honest. So all you'll be doing is rewarding the people who would visit anyway. Um, so yeah. kind of wh wh why why would you do that? So I think it's, it's holding your nerve and being confident that you offer a, a good value, worthwhile experience. Yeah, good advice, Steve. And that also backs up the last um, interview that we had with Simon Addison about being confident in what you're delivering and the price that you're charging yeah. for it. So yeah, yeah, really, really good advice. Okay, what else have you? Uh, what else have you discovered? I think that, that that I think they were probably the main points, really. So yeah, I mean, I, I think as I said, it's going to be pretty tough for membership. So existing members are kind of less likely. We're now seeing they're less likely to renew than we were back in June. And they're less likely to to acquire new memberships as well. Yeah, and and, and yeah, just just more reticent about about using squeezing as much as the value out of existing membership as well. Yeah, it's interesting the membership one because uh, my national trust membership is up for renewal in January time. Um, we were very kindly um, gifted it for a wedding present last year, and I'm absolutely going to renew because for me. Mm -hmm that's been an inc that's, it's such incredible value for money and we were li we were literally talking about it last night we were like well it's fine like in general we'll, we'll, we'll renew our membership we'll make sure that we are not only using the brilliant you know national trust parks that are around us like Wimpole, um, Anglesey Abbey etc ICWA but go further afield as well so actually if we're if we're going to use that membership then we don't mind traveling a little bit further even though that's going to cost us a bit more in petrol to go to that attraction because you're then not paying the attraction fee on top of the travel costs as well so yeah it's funny that that was I'd never even considered not not renewing it yeah and I, I'm exactly the same um but and, and I guess let's be clear here you know I, I said 50 percent of the population are feeling worse off than they did at this point last year but then 50 percent are feeling okay the same or better and I think but it was something like 15 percent so we we're actually feeling better off than last year which I think kind of says something about where we're going as society this is kind of being pulled apart even further to be honest with you so there, there is a, you know there are still significant proportions of people that are feeling fine about things and 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 will renew their memberships or see them as a charitable donation. Mm -hmm. I Steve, I want to ask you a little bit about pre-booking because we've, we, I mean, we've talked about this for years now, pre-booking. I think there was, um, obviously it was kind of forced upon attractions um, during the pandemic and when they were allowed to open. I still don't know why anyone wouldn't pre-book in advance, but then I am an organised planner. I need to know that I've got my ticket and I'm going to get in. <laughs> I'm not going to have a wasted journey. Mm -hmm. And obviously, for an operational side, from uh, aspect from attractions, it's a, it's a brilliant thing to be able to do. What's the kind of uh, what's the kind of sentiment now um, from general public? Are they still happy with it? Are they um, starting to want to go back to the old days where things were just a little bit more flexible and a bit more kind of spontaneous? Yeah, well, I, th I think almost it's it's switching that around a little bit. I mean, I I, I think obviously COVID was this fantastic opportunity to almost um, change the culture of the public to one where, as you said, it's it's why wouldn't you pre-book an attraction in the same way that you would pre-book lots of other things in society, like going to the theatre or going to a restaurant or whatever. So I th certainly paid paid attractions. So it was a really good opportunity to to change to change the the, the culture. So I th I think the main point for me is that attractions need to be proactive in encouraging encouraging that behavior so it's not something that will naturally come to to the public and public sentiment won't change unless attractions are proactive in changing it so what, what kind of what, why would it really so I, I think um it's incumbent upon attractions to really kind of create that appetite for pre-booking and i think to an extent we, we're beginning to get there but i think there's a lot more to be done in terms of you know, what nudges can we can we put to the public to encourage them to pre-book? So I, I think things like online discounts that are notable or you know, switching it around premiums to walk-ups, depending on which way you want to look at it, <laughs> um, are kind of, especially should be used more than they probably are at the moment. And yeah, so I, I think that's, and, and things like, you know, dynamic pricing for advanced booking, for example. Again, I know you talked to Simon, 
Simon Addison about dynamic pricing last week, but the more that that can be used in particular for things like um, advanced booking, I think just uh, will encourage encourage pre-booking. And then gradually over a period of time, it then gets ingrained into the people's psyche. I'm going to an attraction, therefore I will pre-book. Um, so I think it's just one of those that I think the industry as a whole almost needs to come together and say, right, we're going to push pre-booking as, as much as we possibly can because we need to change the way that society thinks about booking attractions. You know, it, it's easy for me to sit here and say that and it's much more difficult to do. But I think that's that's what, what needs to be done because, yeah, as we've seen, there's, there's huge benefits in terms of creating that relationship with anybody as soon as you grab their email address. Um, and that, that investment or the, you know, the discounts you offer may well pay dividends in, in years to come because you've managed to keep that relationship going, which means you get more repeat visits, you get more top of mind, so you get more recommendation being spread around, etc. So I think it's a, it's a, a worthwhile investment. Brilliant. Yeah, good advice. I agree with every every single word that you've said, Steve. So um, thanks for back, back, thanks for backing up everything that I put online about it as well. That's okay, all right. Well, um, to be honest, it helped me as well from on my on my visitor surveys. I now try and make sure that they are kind of online post visit surveys, which tend to help um, the more pre bookers that people have got. So um, it makes that research a lot more cost effective, should we say as well? Great. Good. Helping us all round, Steve. That's what I like. Sector collaboration and all that. <laughs> right, Steve, thank you for sharing your insights today. It's really appreciated. And I know that this will help a lot of people that are feeling a little bit anxious about what's going on and just not really sure what way, like how to approach things. So um, thank you very much. I always ask, we ask our guests to recommend a book that they love or something that's helped shape their career in some way. What have you got for us today? Okay, so... Um... I've, I've read this book called Silt Road, Silt Road rather than Silk Road, by a guy called Charles Rangley Wilson or Rangley Wilson, not quite sure to be honest. And uh, it's quite nice, this, so be prepared. <laughs> um, it, it tells the it's the, tells the social history of High Wycombe, which is where I live, through the lens of the River Wye, which sort of runs through it, although most of it's been culverted and put under a, a shopping centre and a flyover these days. It, it, yeah, it, it tells that story through the lens of a river. It tells a story about things like the, the mills on the river, the history of Wickham as a, a furniture and chair making town, um, which which led to me actually be, being, so I'm now chair of the uh, Wickham Chair Museum, which is uh, uh, <laughs> rather ironic. But, That's uh, you know, niche as well, isn't it? I love it. Incredibly niche, it's incredibly niche. And it also tells the story of, of, of uh, things like how trout became, um, so trout are a thing in New Zealand apparently, and they are a thing in New Zealand because they were taken from the River Wye uh, and transported over thousands of miles to New Zealand many years ago. But, but the reason why I mention it is because I'm not originally from Wickham, I've lived here for about 15 years, but it really helped me kind of form this identity with the town because it's Wickham is a few miles outside London, it's very commuterable, which means that actually there's not many people who live in Wickham who are originally from Wickham. So I'm a big believer in getting kind of pride in your local area so you look after it better and make more of a contributor to the community. So books like this help with that because it's really helped me to understand Wickham in more, in more detail, understand the social history and feel more proud of the place I live um so I I, it's, it's not really it's not really a recommendation to read that specific book it's more a kind of a, a plea to go and find out a bit more about your local area read about the social history so that you feel more proud about the places you live in and more connected to it as well uh, completely yeah yeah Pride Steve, i think that's lovely um it's amazing the stuff that you can earn on this podcast, isn't it? Who knew? <laughs> Who knew? Who knew that we can? I had no idea that it was a big chair and furniture manufacturer in place and yeah. And then you've got a chair museum as well. We, we do. And yes, <laughs> it's mentioned in Gavin and Stacey as well. Is it? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, uh, I mean, and I'm an Essex girl, so that, that fits for me too. Well, so. J- James, Corden, James Corden's from High Wycombe, so that's why it's mentioned in there. <laughs> gotcha. Right. Okay. Well, look, listeners, if you want to win Steve's book, and why wouldn't you? Um, if you go over to our Twitter account and you retweet this episode announcement with the word, I want Steve's book, then we'll get you a copy of that book. We'll get you a copy of it and you could be in a, with a chance of winning it. And then you can find out about High Wickham as well. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. It's been an education. 
Absolute pleasure. Thanks for listening to Skip the Queue. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a five-star review. It really helps others find us. And remember to follow us on Twitter for your chance to win the books that have been mentioned. Skip the Queue is brought to you by Rubber Cheese, a digital agency that builds remarkable systems and websites for attractions that helps them increase their visitor numbers. You can find show notes and transcriptions from this episode and more over on our website, rubbercheese.com forward slash podcast.